Hi, in this presentation, I'm going to be talking about the Husky Set 1. And in particular, I'm going to be talking about the design considerations that went into this project in the power system, in making printed circuit boards, and then in the K band uh, transmitter communication system. So, a little bit about my background. So, I have a mechanical engineering undergraduate from Michigan Technological University. And then I came out here for a master's and PhD in physics um, at the University of Washington. For work, I have about two years of experience with Blue Origin, where I was the second stage uh, communication uh, system lead. And then right now I work at first mode, uh, where we're, we're retrofitting uh, vehicles uh, that have a, a diesel engine with a, a hydrogen fuel cell power plant. Okay, so what I'm going to be talking about today was primi primarily um, my efforts, um, but there were a number of other individuals and organizations that have made this work possible. So there's the Husky satellite team. Um, so the project itself had a lot of people, a lot of undergraduates in particular, that helped make it possible. Um, so shown there is just a picture from 2018. And then shown at the bottom here are a number of organizations um, that have supported our work. Okay, so I'd like to just give a quick overview of what the Husky Sat is. So it's the first CubeSat developed by the University of Washington. So CubeSats, uh, for those that don't know, are just a, a small satellite um, that's launched into space uh, and it, it follows a particular form factor. So it's shown on the right here of, of the actual flight model. So it's about the size of a, of a loaf of bread and they're inexpensive to, to launch. Um, and they're inexpensive to develop. So they're quite popular in uh, universities. So this first CubeSat um, developed here was quite ambitious for a CubeSat in general, but especially for a first CubeSat from a university. So we had a pulse plasma thruster that was developed in house. We implemented the CAN data bus, um, which is originally from the automotive world. We partnered with the AMSAT um, group uh, and they provided us a uh, linear transponder radio to incorporate onto our, our satellite. And then um, additionally, there was a high frequency at 24 gigahertz uh, transmitter system on board. You can actually see that in the picture here up on top. All the software and the circuit designs are completely open source, so links to those can actually be found at the end. So the HuskySat was deployed initially on um, uh, January 31st, 2020. It operated under UW's um, control for about 90 days and then it was handed over uh, to AMSAT. Uh, there were a number of malfunctions on the satellite. So although it did, um, it did uh, work in, in many ways, there were a couple um, critical areas related to the, the power system and the communication system that uh, uh, ended up today where, where we're not getting the beaconing as we should. So the last, um, the last uh, data we've downlinked was at the end of 2020, and we have not heard from it since. Okay, so a little bit about the design. Um, just this is a high level zoomed out um, version, and I can go into more in the questions if, if desired. So um, down here is the pulse plasma thruster, and this itself breaks apart, and there's a lot going on inside. Um, and then same thing on the other side. So we have the K-band system that inside here, there's a lot of circuit boards. Um, so if we just start at the bottom here, so we have the pulse plasma thruster, above that's the power system. So I'll talk about that next a little bit more. And then above that is the attitude determination and control subsystem. Um, and then wedged in, in there is the actual camera board. Um, above that is the AMSAT linear transponder. On top of that is the um, ISIS uh, dipole uh, antenna. So basically we wanted a low gain um, communication system that wasn't developed in-house, uh, just you know, use external expertise because that, that system is critical to work. So we just bought that antenna and then partnered with AMSAT for the radio. And then beyond these subsystems, the actual structure is quite simple. So there's just a, a top ring and a, and a bottom ring, um, and then there's four rails that bolt onto it, and then there's these panels that, that bolt onto the rails. And then on the very outside, three of the sides have the um, PCBs that have the solar panels mounted to them. 
Okay, so the power system um, was the, the top level uh, drivers for the design were a peak power requirement and then a, and a, and a energy requirement. So the peak power requirement here came from uh, the propulsion system. So the propulsion system uses a flyback um, topology to generate 1000 volts. So it's a sawtooth waveform with an eight amp peak current. Um, so to support that from such a small system, um, a lot of, a lot of uh, design consideration had to go in there to, to make sure we could handle that amount of current. Um, and then the energy requirement K came from the K-band transmitter just because um, the K-band transmitter drew around you know, 15 watts when it was turned on, um, and that far exceeded what the, the solar panels could provide at any given time. Uh, the, and then and additionally to those top requirements, there was also the cycle life requirement. So the fact that we're going into low Earth orbit, so we have a, around a 90 minute period, and then the temperature swings of the orbit. So uh, from there, um, we, we had to select a, a, a battery cell configuration. So how many cells and then what, what series parallel configuration and then what type of cell chemistry. So we, we went with the lithium phosphate chemistry um, and listed there as the, the actual um, make and model. And, and this, this actual cell has been flown by their CubeSats before. So it's had some flight heritage. It's safer than lithium ion cells um, without any protection. So if you, if you short a lithium phosphate battery, it generates less heat in general than a lithium ion. Um, and then their, their cycle life is higher um, just off the shelf. So before any derating. So once we did get this cell, we did additionally derate it. So we took the upper bound voltage. So the, the specified upper bound voltage was 3.6 volts um, and the lower bound uh, was around two volts. So we essentially brought both those ranges in to give us a little headroom on the bottom. So we're never going to 100% um, depth, of depth of discharge. And then um, the upper end is lowered as well. And that, and that increases the, the cycle life. So shown here um, at the bottom, uh, the diagram, um, what the, the takeaway here is how we're actually protecting uh, loads. And this kind of helps explain how the overall functionality uh, was set up. So the solar panel, uh, solar panels over here, they feed in around 15 volts, goes to the solar cell generation board, which is essentially just a fancy buck converter. And then that outputs bus voltage. Now bus voltage moves around. So depending upon the battery state of, state of charge and then um, the given loads. Uh, so this will fluctuate. Um, so that solar cell generation board had to, to, to provide for that. Um, the, the cells were a 2P2S. So there's two parallel two series arrangement. And then uh, most loads in the satellite went through first a high side switch and then there was a current measurement. So this combination here, there were um, you know, multiple duplicate circuitries here, just one is shown here. So essentially then subsystem load, so other boards then got um, a unregulated bus voltage. Um, and then as, as, as needed, they would then have um, point of load converters. So how overcurrent protection worked then was there was a microprocessor collecting telemetry. And part of that telemetry was uh, current voltage uh, power and then there, that microprocessor could actuate the high side switch. So this topology was useful because it did double duty. We, we still wanted the ability to turn things on and off um, just for power domain switching, but then if something overcurrented, we could um, autonomously essentially just, just turn it off. Um, and then the microprocessor doing this logic had its own um, unique overcurrent protection. So it had a voltage regulator um, to go out on a 3.3, and then it had a high side auto retry switch. So this is just designed for like USB buses. Um, so this topology is really clean logically. We, we did run into some challenges um, later in integration when we began to realize that the overcurrent protection quality uh, or the, 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 the speed at which it acted um, was, was difficult to, to actually make work well or work fast enough. So nominally, we designed this to run at 10 Hertz. So at 10 Hertz, it would collect telemetry and then um, 
and then disconnect it if, if needed. So shown here on the right are the, the actual flight cells. So these are what are in space now. Um, and then shown wrapped around the cells are little battery heaters. And then shown in the bottom picture here are, uh, is the, the power system stack. So on the bottom is the battery board. So the, the four cells, so that, that yellow cell is just what the, the cells come wrapped in and the flight cells we had to um, take the wrapping off to inspect. And then that battery board had additional circuitry. Um, so battery balancing, uh, coulomb counter, um, and then the heaters. Uh, and then this was a distributed architecture. So each of these boards shown here, um, like most boards in the, in the Husky SAT, had their own microprocessor and then their own CAN controller. So the top board shown here is the solar cell generation board. So it looks a little bit more complicated than just a buck converter. So there's three strings here, and then each of the string has to have a cutoff. So when this, when the CubeSat, before it's deployed, it needs a way to cut the power to everything on the bus. So that was achieved here by essentially putting these high side switches in on their input. And these are different high side switches than the ones shown over here. And then the middle board here is the, what we call the power distribution board. And that houses all the high side switches and current measurement um, to, to essentially distribute out to the rest of the satellite. Okay, so I want to move on and, and shift gears a little bit and talk specifically about how we um, made printed circuit boards. So when we started this program, we didn't have any of this know-how. So we kind of you know, stumbled along the way to, to figure out a method that worked well for, for our organization. Um, so this is a particular way to do it. It's not necessarily quote unquote the right way. I think it depends upon the organization, how many people, what the risk tolerance is. Um, those types of things. So the first thing is two or four layer only. Um, and, and the reason to stick to two or four layers is just design complexity. So once you're getting to, let's say, six or eight layers, the amount of resources to design a board increases. The complexity of what you're trying to do is, is getting you know, pretty complicated. Um, and then cost. So staying within four layers makes the costs a lot lower. Next thing we did is we, um, as much as possible, went to two millimeter. So I think standard is 1.6 millimeter thickness. So by going to two millimeter, it just makes it so the component mass matters less on your boards. Uh, next, so for thermal reasons, we would go to two ounce copper as needed. So essentially one ounce was standard. And then if there was a high thermal load we had to, to get rid of, we would then Put a larger pour in and then thicken it to two ounces. And in general, we approach thermal, at least at the local level, by just the, the half watt. Sometimes it's a three quarter watt rule, which is if your integrated circuit you know, draws a half a watt or less, you just simply ignore it. Um, you still have to add up you know, the cumulative on a, on a given board and consider that. But sometimes boards didn't draw that much. So like the one on the right, for instance, shown here, it doesn't really have um, anything that draws over half a watt. So we don't have to care about thermal rise per se. Um, now, selecting components. So 808.05 um, passives or larger. So this was chosen because we wanted to be able to hand assemble these quickly um, and not have to use a magnifying glass. So 0805 were found to be the smallest parts that were easy to handle. And then for more complex devices, so QFN, we did use, but we did not prefer to use them. So QFN are packages of integrated circuits where the feet go are on the edge, but they curl under. And the problem with these is you can't easily inspect the solder joints. Um, so, so you just have to be very careful. Um, and I did, I'll talk a little bit about later an issue we ran into with QFN. And then we did not use any BGA. So we, we did integrate some components that had pre solder BGA, but we just didn't mount those ourselves. So what we preferred were integrated circuits that had feet that were exposed as shown here. So you can actually essentially just see the solder joints and these are much easier to work with. For actual manufacturing of the, the blank boards, um, we used Elecro, which is just a company out of China. Um, 
OSH Park is quite common for hobbyists, but we found this company to be definitely cheaper when you get into to higher volumes and then faster, um, and then you have more customization. For assembly, everything was done by hand. Um, so everything, you know, pick in place essentially. So before boards would come in, you lay components out, make sure you have everything. And then, and then when the board comes in, you're assembling, you, can, you have to work pretty quick because of the drying out of the um, solder paste. So solder paste was applied using a stencil. So this made a huge difference um, for consistency uh, to, to do that right the first time. Uh, the reflow oven, the control Leo, was essentially a few hundred dollar um, hacked together or packaged. Uh, you essentially just convert a reflow. Uh, you convert a toaster oven into a little reflow oven. And that worked um, very, very well once it's tuned in for the, for the actual application that you're doing. Um, and then, of course, there are some miscellaneous items like a you know, sharp soldering iron. A thermal IR bed is helpful for the boards have big components on like the two ounce copper pores um, just to help heat everything up. Um, and then of course a hot air gun, but we really didn't need that much for resources to, to turn these boards out. Okay, so now more considerations, and this is moving from prototypes to more operation or production boards. So the first thing was cleaning the boards. So we used a combination of a uh, MG Chemicals product called Safety Wash and then isopropyl alcohol. Um, so we'd use a safety wash first. And since we were trying to clean out oil residue from the hands and then um, flux uh, residue. So we'd use an ultrasonic bath. Um, and then between the, the leads of the integrated circuits, um, you'd have to usually get in there with a brush and scrub it a little bit. Um, once it's clean, the next step was securing things down. So uh, staking, we did a lot of, um, and that's shown up here that this is a good example. So some things uh, were staked were connectors as shown here. So if you just don't want a connector to come out, uh, like here, this is critical. So this was the switch that gave the whole satellite power. So we really didn't want this to fail. Some staking was done on actual thread or nuts. Um, so sometimes you could also use thread locker, but in this circumstance, um, we couldn't pre-torque it just because we're, we're squishing something really um, soft here. So you can't get enough pre-torque down. So if there's only one method, then uh, epoxy was chosen. And then here, this is shown just, we have cables routing and, and, and somewhere in the middle, we just tack it down. Um, and then capped on tape was put over it just temporarily to hold it while the epoxy dries and then that capped on tape was just left there. We also use self-locking fasteners. Um, so because this was going into space, we couldn't use like nylon insert ones, but we used like the, the biting teeth kind um, or like the deformed uh, threads. And then Loctite we used um, for certain screws. So, so that was especially helpful um, for if, if you were bolting down something squishy like an FR4 board. And then conformal coating was used to actually protect the boards. Um, so there's different types. The NG chemical products are nice because they just come in a can. Um, so we just used a silicon based one. Um, and the tricky part was actually how to apply it. So once the boards were clean, they had to be masked. Um, and then this little these little threaded rods were developed and then there's magnets. So essentially what we do is we'd spray, um, we'd spray the board and then you could pick up these boards using just the threads and then you could rotate it 90 degrees, spray again, and then you could flip it over. So we, we, we did both sides that way. Okay, so the development structure of this project was interesting because we had a lot of students that were really in, uh, interested and willing to give their time to this project, but um, you know, their previous work experience in this type of area was you know, very limited. And then because they're full-time students, the amount of time students could put towards this project was also limited. Um, so one thing we did early on was we, we, we implemented a distributed architecture such that um, many people could work on things in parallel, kind of separately. So flat sat shown up here kind of shows that we're, 
you have all these boards breaking broken out and you could imagine you could have circuit boards you know turn the other direction in the satellite that would house um you know more functions together and i think that would be advantageous um from from the point of view if it was just like fewer people working on it just because there was a bit more overhead to manage so many different pcb um, versions for pcb quantities um at least two so the problem with ever making one is if it doesn't work you don't know if it's the um, assembly process that was erroneous or if it's a design so by building two or three together at the same time you can very quickly determine or you can at least get the suggestion where to look next for for debugging it and we adopted in this project a very um i guess brute force mentality as in we we took really small steps in terms of PCB complexity, and then we just iterated really fast. So we had one to three week turn time on a PCB. So that's starting a design, um, starting the schematic, doing the layout, sending it out to Electros, ordering things from DigiKey, assembling and testing. So that whole time frame, um, you know, could get squished down into a week. We used a lot of LEDs, and these were helpful just because. Um, you know, we were learning the process of how to design the board, so having more feedback was better. Um, and with that, data visualization became really useful. So shown down here, um, we had a monitor wall driven by instances of Cosmos. So that allowed us to see the data. And because we had so many different students involved, it was really helpful to have people stand there and, and can pick out, you know, something that doesn't look quite right. Okay, so now I'm going to switch gears and talk um, specifically about the reflect array. Um, so the reflect array is a antenna system that initially was slated to to um, deploy or, or be incorporated onto Husky Sat One. Uh, we ran into some descoping issues where we actually didn't have the pointing capability we we initially thought we'd have. So the k-band system was uh, de-scoped to be a wider beam width system um, so the intention though with with this project was to uh, develop a stepping stone towards cubesats or small satellites that can communicate back to earth from really far away from earth so that means higher gain uh, antennas and cubesats being limited size uh, your you're limited in terms of what types of antennas uh, you can use. Um, so the reflect array is one type of antenna, uh, which has uh, a lot of potential in that way. So the reflect array uh, initially developed in the 1960s, but it, it really didn't see um, widespread application, and it hasn't yet even to today. So there's been two previous applications on the CubeSat. Um, and, and my application that I worked on is slightly different. Um, so I'll, I'll highlight that in a little bit. So the reflect way works by um, having a feed antenna. So it's similar to a parabolic dish where there's a feed antenna. And that feed antenna illuminates a surface. So you, you have to um, think about the path distance or the ray distance from the feed antenna face center down to the surface and it reflects and it bounces off. So in the parabolic case, it's the parabolic shape that, that creates a geometry that makes it so this path distance is equal. And in that way, you're getting that coherent uh, wavefront. So in the reflector ray case, uh, it's, it's the surface down here that you can actually impart a controlled phase with. So uh, the the ray comes and you still have to care about the path length distance but now you can vary the phase between zero and 360 degrees arbitrarily arbitrarily so anywhere on the surface and what's really good about this is it's compatible with the cubesat form factor so you could for instance have the perfect array folded on the sides or stored on the sides and it could unfold into something large and in this way, you can um, most efficiently use the, the CubeSat volume. So 
initially, uh, COM2 was motivated to, to push forward the, the state of the art, um, and especially from a, a low cost point of view, um, because if something costs, you know, a half a million dollars, while it exists, it's important that that gets uh, more affordable and, and more accessible by, by different organizations. Um, so beyond the reflector ray, uh, the frequency regime that I was interested in is, is the K-band. Um, and that's because NASA has uh, deep space network support there. So NASA has a, a near earth K-band frequency of around 25.5 to I think 27 gigahertz. And then they have a deep space um, Ka band in the 32 gigahertz range. So the intent was to uh, develop this system in the amateur radio um, band of 24 gigahertz um, and, and have that methodology um, developed here apply uh, to, to the higher frequencies. So um, the high-level goals was to develop a transmitter and reflectory system um, that were both scalable. So make it small so it's, it's faster to iterate and learn on and then have those, those principles be scaled up. Um, it also had to fit within a 3U CubeSat. So CubeSats come in, in different, um, different volume configurations. So HuskySat 1 was a 3U, which is about 3 liters worth of volume. Um, and CubeSats get quite a bit bigger. So 12U um, and then 24U, uh, and they keep getting a little bit bigger uh, as, as capabilities are, are demanding it. Another intent was to make the system low cost, um, just for primarily accessibility. So that means using as much as possible commercial off-the-shelf components. So nothing specialized, something you can just buy and then using very simple manufacturing techniques. Um, and particularly, um, so this applies to what type of milling operations, uh, assembly operations, and then uh, what type of circuit board um, type, uh, 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 geometries. Okay, so here's a design overview. So just starting on the bottom here, we start with commands and data, and this comes in on the CAN bus. So that hits a Raspberry Pi just running Linux, and that goes to just an off-the-shelf um, software-defined radio. So the intent of these two items here, although not ideal for volume or power, um, the intent was just to uh, get something that could run uh, GNU radio, um, just so we could very quickly um, implement uh, implement you know our modulated signal. So. The output then from the software defined radio was around two gigahertz, and that goes to the RF front end, and that's a that's a homebrew system I'll be talking about. And then that outputs, so that essentially just up converts our signal and then amplifies it to around one watt, and then that powers the four element feed. So that feed then sits here if we switch to the top diagram, and then that feed illuminates this deployed surface. So it's just a single hinge deployable. And on that, um, on that de uh, deployable, there's a 10 by 10, so there's a 100 element uh, reflectory antenna, which then uh, makes a coherent beam uh, coming to the left here. OK, so the feed antenna starts with the the single element so it's it's four elements in the end but from a design point of view it starts as a single element um, so the trick here was how to do this um, in a low risk way and and develop uh, develop this using simple manufacturing techniques so that meant staying with two layers and and not using vias if if not needed so this is a two layer board right so the bottom is just ground. And then this is a truncated corner. So it's very simple. Um, it doesn't have high um, fractional bandwidth, but at, the, at you know, what we need here, we don't need very wide fractional bandwidth. It's frequency sensitive. So we did actually have to iterate um, on this design to, to get the right uh, performance. So the first one we built, you know, the, where the axle ratio was um, ideal or, or best was not lined up with, um, with the, just the S11. So we had to, to tweak uh, 
um, that a little bit. So sh shown here is this little bit here, that's just a quarter, uh, quarter wave transformer to get to the 50 ohm line. And then all throughout the project, these end launch connectors are used, which are uh, made by Southwest Microwave. And they worked really well because, um, you know, they were around $50 and then it could very easily unscrew this and then just put it onto a different PCB. So once that, that single element was made, the next um, step was to make it into an array. So the tricky part with the array is the feed. Um, so the feed enters right there. So the RF energy en enters right there. And then if you look at just the antennas, they're sequentially rotated. So each one's rotating 90 degrees relative to last. And what this does is this just smooths out the, the, the game pattern um, because these are circularly polarized. So we're kind of averaging out the circular polarization, which is really important because you know we're single fed here, so we're not very symmetric. Um, so the challenge with this feed network is we have to feed each antenna 90 degrees offset from each other to, to counteract the actual physical rotation. And then the power splitting has to be such that each one gets 25% of the net power. So like the RF energy comes in and this first leg gets 25% of the power, and then this gets 75%. So each junction point has to then um, have the right amount of uh, the right ratio of power branch off. So this this was then um, uh, tested, um, and it was basically spot on. Well, not not fully spot on, but but for a first go, um, very very good, um, uh, definitely good enough to move on at that point. There was more testing that wasn't shown here about this solder joint. I I worried a lot about that solder joint messing up the S11. So I did do a little trinket test to essentially verify that I could come in here with, with the solder joint and then uh, verify that the SMA cable that I was using would work. So the SMA cable is only rated up to 12 gigahertz, right? So or a 24 gigahertz. Um, so I did quite a bit of testing to, to verify that that all worked out. Okay, so the feed antenna um, is in place. And then now we're gonna talk about the actual reflector ray surface. So, so this is the, the bit that can change the, the phase from the feed. So the feed comes in as the incident wave, and then it essentially excites uh, this, this top conductor. Um, so think of this as like a microstrip antenna. So this microstrip antenna, we want to excite it with the incident energy, and then it retransmits that incoming energy. And then some of the energy from the feed will come down and just hit the ground plane and then reflect. Um, and that's undesired because that's not being phase controlled. Um, and it's also flipped polarization. So the feed is circularly polarized. So then if you reflect off the ground plane, the polarization flips, whereas the retransmitted component um, does not flip polarization. So there's different ways to impart the phase shift. So two common methods are the variable rotation method and then the variable tuning method. So um, JPL's refectories use the the, the variable tuning method to impart a phase shift. And um, the, the limitation with this method is you cannot get full 360 degrees of phase control, uh, whereas you can with the variable rotation method. So this specific um, element chosen is shown here on the right, and it's called the double split ring. Okay, so just now going over what the actual design steps are. Um, so first is element geometry. So it's choosing a specific geometry. It's optimizing that geometry. So you want a geometry that suppresses uh, the incident or the reflected wave. You want it to, to have that retransmitted wave. You want good manufacturability. So you don't want too narrow of gaps. Um, so you want to do a sensitivity analysis to look at that. And then there's actually the gain pattern of this 
individual element that can actually contribute to your overall pattern. Um, so from there, I built a 10 by 10 array uh, with zero element rotation. So that's shown here. So they're all at the same rotation. And then I took a two horns um, and they're dual circularly polarized. So I could choose um, either, either polarization. So I transmitted a circularly polarized wave in um, and essentially did S21 with a VNA. So then I could look on their they receive antenna and, and pick apart the reflected component versus the retransmitted component. So then see exactly where you know, this array is resonating at. Um, and then very you know, meticulously build a new one of these. So thankfully this was easy. This was inexpensive to manufacture. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about that. So it was easy to, to come in here. So it took three iterations to then nail that, that center frequency. So another um, design consideration is the feed spillover. So that means when your feed antenna illuminates your surface, it's not going to do that perfectly. So there's two extremes. So the, the one extreme would be you just illuminate the center elements, and then you're not utilizing the whole array. Um, and then the opposite extreme is you illuminate this more uniformly, but then a bunch of energy spills over. So there's this balance point, and it depends upon the application. Um, you know, if you're doing some radar application, it, you might have different uh, drivers than peer communications. Um, and then, of course, this gets into you know side lobe uh, suppression. Okay, so then with that chosen, um, then you can back out the the imparted phase from the feed antenna onto the array. So. You can do this just with ray tracing. Um, I actually looked at the, the full um, ENM solution um, from HFSS and compared the two and actually found that ray tracing was very good. So they were at most, I think, seven degrees off, but that was on one of the edge elements. Um, and you know the edge elements were a lot lower power. So uh, that, that had minimal contribution. So ray tracing definitely in a larger scale, um, a larger scale system would 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 be uh, the way to go. Okay, so here is a prototype. Um, so this is just showing what that what that looks like, and then here's the the simulated gain, and I was able to measure the on-axis gain and confirm that it agreed here. Okay, so. Um, moving on now to the RF front end. So the RF front end, again, takes in a low frequency baseband signal from the SDR, and then it outputs um, the, the, the 24 gigahertz uh, amplified signal. So shown here is just the RF chain, which is you know, fairly straightforward. Um, this section here is essentially a local oscillator that just outputs 22 gigahertz. And then there's a, a single stage mixing sta uh, stage here. And then there's a bandpass filter. And then we go through two amplification stages. So the design methodology was incremental prototyping. And um, part of this was you know, figuring out how to, how to design, how to build, how to assemble these um, on the fly. And then it's difficult to probe, right? So in other circuits, like digital circuits, you can just stick down an oscilloscope. Here, you couldn't. So here was very much like, OK, let's just design something for the phase lock loop um, voltage controlled oscillator. OK, that works. And let's continue along the chain, you know, Fallon frequency multiplier, another frequency multiplier. Um, so you can see here, too, we're just using bare copper boards at this time. So it was cheap, and it actually worked quite well. So I just soldered to them pretty quick before the oxidation began um, too much. And then it, was, it wasn't um, that difficult, actually, to, to work with that. So the bandpass filter was one of the items that um, couldn't be bought. Maybe you can buy these now in this frequency range. But what we needed at the time was not available. So this had to be integrated to the circuit board. And it's, um, it's the only item that's like frequency sensitive on the board. Um, so, so a lot of attention went into to making sure this was done right. Um, so shown here are the various iterations. Um, 
shown here is just a microstrip pass through because I wanted to calibrate and know what the loss was with, of the microstrip versus just the, the actual filter. Shown on the right is the pass band. Okay, so a number of design obstacles. So from an EMI EMC point of view, I was very conservative because I didn't want to have to iterate on any of those types of issues. So some of the, the things that, that were chosen for that was everything in the RF front end was isolated from the digital in terms of cavity. So the, the analog was in its own cavity, sealed off, no digital uh, could get up there, or that, that was the intent. A lot of DC filtering. So this meant um, you know, every single RF device had capacitors right at its input, um, which is just good practice. A lot of uh, or independent LDO, so LDOs were not, um, outputs were not paralyzed. Um, and then grounded coplanar waveguides were used over microstrip just because uh, they're more controlled. So they have higher conductor losses, um, but lower emissions and lower susceptibility. So that bandpass filter was microstrip, so it's going to radiate more. So an RF absorber was just preemptively put above it um, to, to help um, prevent any issues with that. Um, talked about the, the prototyping. Now, the manufacturing uh, cost, that, that's a huge issue with these high frequency boards because you're sandwiching, typically you sandwich like a Roger substrate onto an F04 substrate, and then you have like 10 layers and it's like thousands of dollars. Um, so I got around that by, by making everything high frequency on the Rogers. The Roger substrate comes with copper on it. So the copper is smooth. You don't have to worry about the quality of what's being deposited. And then I used a little business in Capitol Hill that has an LPKF laser. So then essentially just cutting out the structures um, that were needed. So this was very fast and inexpensive. For the final board that was sent into space, um, uh, a different company was used just because uh, uh, for, for silver plating capability. And then that bandpass filter was remade um, because of that frequency sensitivity. I just wanted to verify that. So surprisingly, the frequency, center frequency and shape did not change, but it got shifted down. So it was just a, a higher, the, the, the S21 did not allow as much through. Okay, so how did I actually make uh, you know, this work with just a two-layer board? So what I developed here was essentially taking Rogers 4000 and sandwiching it to FR4, but building them separate. So the FR4 still came from Elecro, Rogers uh, came, uh, and then I could actually test the Rogers separate, make sure it, everything works, and then you know come in there with all the leads needed. And then I could put those together. And I just used polyamide, double-sided tape, um, something to allow for thermal growth um, or that differential growth. And then there was pins or holes that were aligned and then pins were put in. So these were, these are essentially vias, right? And um, they're bigger vias and, and thankfully, you know, I don't need that many. Um, so, so on the bottom board, nothing high frequency was routed. So it was just DC routing essentially and then enable signals. Um, and we'll see, I'll show you what this actually looks like in the end. So shown here is that top board and then you can see essentially capped on tape is holding them together. And in the next picture, you can see the separation. Um, but here, I just wanted to quickly review some of the layout considerations. So essentially, as I prototyped, you know, this section up here was what I showed before. That's that local oscillator. Nothing changed from a layout point of view. So everything stayed intact as possible to reduce the, the, the risk of, of things not working in the future. And then the rest of the layout here Everything was moved away from the bandpass filter, knowing this thing radiates. Um, and then the SMA connector wanted this centered and at the edge. So essentially on the left here have, have power input, have digital input. So we did need to come in here with a spy connection to, to program the phase lock loop voltage controlled oscillator. But then this digital isolator has an enable. So essentially it just got unpowered or turned off when it wasn't needed. And then shown on the right here is all the the DC isolation, which is you know pushed away from from the uh, 
from the bandpass filter. Okay, so shown on the left is um, is the prototype. So the SMA connection here is just right here. And then there's a SMA cable to the feed antenna. So that's that four element feed antenna I talked about earlier. And then shown on the right is everything that is in this aluminum enclosure. So this, there's actually two aluminum enclosures. So there's a top enclosure that's just for this top board. And here you can actually see now the separation. So there's an FR4 board, and then you can see that thin Rogers board. So then below it, um, this bottom board just had uh, power regulation. It had the CAN controller um, and support circuitry for the Raspberry Pi, which sits right here. And then this is that software defined radio. Okay, so that's all I have. So thank you for listening.